Okay, so don't worry about how much time we've spent on government. I'm going to do a little bit more, and it always takes me more than one session. Um, if they give me an hour, then it takes me more than an hour. If they give me a half hour, it takes me more than a half hour. So it just kind of grows because it is so foundational that we get the definition of civil governance right because it builds on every other right we have in society. And it is our biggest confusion when it comes to wanting to engage our societies today. We have this idea that somehow as Christians we could get a hold of things and we could maybe not make but sort of push people into doing the right thing. And God absolutely says it won't work. And he says it from Genesis chapter 3 on. He not only says it won't work, they won't do the right thing, but you will destroy the image of God in the individual because you are taking away the choices God has given and replacing it with control. And the spirit of control is demonic. That's right. <laughs> so literally, we may be trying to build the kingdom of God with an understanding of justice that is that is Satan's. God wants to build his kingdom through freedom and choice. And so what is what what is uh, what is the city of God in Revelation? It is those who have chosen him. And that's what he wants those who have chosen them. And, and what is the, 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 the composite of hell? Those who have chosen their own. Whatever it is, it's theirs rather than God's. Heaven and hell is an expression of freedom. You're free to choose. You're not free to be in control of everything. You don't have authority to recreate the universe. But you do have authority to decide who will rule you in some areas of your life. And where did that choice come from? It came from God. So we must distinguish between moral law and civil law. Scripture distinguishes between moral law and civil law. Civil law is, well, let me start with moral law. Moral law, which we'll look at next, is what God says I should do. Civil law is what society says I must do. So we say, well, aren't they the same thing? I've heard this argument over and over and over amongst those engaged in government. Well, shouldn't all law be moral? Well, yes, it should be. That would be great. It's terrible to have immoral laws. But all morality cannot be legal or illegal. Why? Because, you'd, because then we'd have to adjudicate everybody. Because everybody breaks the moral law. So the issue is not what is right and wrong. The issue is what can we get away with civilly in our society. We don't get away with anything before God. <laughs> but we can adjudicate that. Okay, so an example, and I choose sexuality because it's a huge subject in scripture and because it is the subject of this century and because it, judicial rights in this arena is such a huge subject. It's like the battlefield of ideas and values in today's media and culture. 17 sexual practices are forbidden in the law of Moses. No, sorry, not 17, 14. 14 sexual practices are forbidden, meaning God will not bless it. Okay? Seven of them were illegal. Okay, 14 sexual sins, things you shouldn't do. And there's that whole passage in Dune around in me. Don't have sex with your aunt. Don't have sex with animals. Don't have sex with 
you know, your mother, your your mother's daughter, your the uncle of your aunt. I mean, quite clearly, the Jews and I think human beings want to have sex with anything that walks by. And so God assumes we will want sexual diversity, not that we will only wake up one day and magically be attracted to the <gasps> the one. And he says, don't do this. I can't bless it. It will destroy you. But he also says in the law, you should make these seven things illegal. And guess what? All seven are the death penalty. <laughs> so seven is a free pass judiciously. <laughs> and seven are the death penalty. <laughs> What's that all about? Well, God is not trying to perfect our sexual decisions, our moral decisions regarding sexuality through judicial law. He, was, he is telling us what will destroy us, but he's saying these seven things will also destroy the community. Yes. Now, your liberty or rights as an individual are encroaching on the rights of the community. So bestiality is so obvious because all you have to do is study virology. Is it virology? No, viral, sorry, it's another one of those sounds like where viruses come from. <laughs> the vast majority of them, as we understand them better, come to the human uh, chain through the animal chain. It will kill you, God is saying, and he meant it literally. You don't know that now, but it will. Okay, so of the seven that were both immoral and illegal, the one most often dwelled upon is adultery. Sex outside of marriage, marriage being defined by God as a monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. <sighs> well, can't do that anymore. <laughs> We adjusted to that as Christians a long time ago. God says it's not only immoral, it should be illegal. We said, well, yeah, it should be, but we can't keep up to it, even if we're a pastor. Mm -hmm. So we want to go to church and say, you know, I'm sorry for the adultery. I have committed the adultery. I will commit. <laughs> And thank you, Jesus, that you forgive me. And we think, you know, okay, I'm okay personally. Well, you are, but you're still killing the community. Because AIDS and all sexual diseases are transmitted because of adultery. First and foremost is not homosexuality. That will only affect 15, 10% of the population. The vast majority of sexual diseases are transmitted in heterosexual relationships, sex outside of marriage. But we've already said, well, you know, been there, done that, can't, you know, thank you, Jesus. But now we want to forbid and to create borders on other sexual choices. Hmm. Having accepted the sexual choice that God says for sure is the worst and will destroy the population, we now want to forbid the minority. <laughs> Do you know prostitution was not illegal in the law? But it's immoral. You didn't go to jail for prostitution. You went to jail for adultery, meaning you had sex for money with somebody that was married. Or you're married. <laughs> do, you, do you see? We're not thinking biblically, we're thinking culturally. So we say, well, in Africa, this is our tradition. And in Europe, we say, but this is our tradition. And lo and behold, it's the Catholics in France shouting the loudest about God's tradition. <laughs> well, that's new and interesting. And in America, we say, but this is our, this is the way we do it. Yes, but we cannot maintain a judicial system 
that is more moral than the people empowered to make law. Why can we not? The people will rebel. They'll, they'll just say, we'll lose if we have people empowered to make a choice. And the only way we can stop that then is we have to get control. Oh, now we're going to have kings and <laughs> dictators. But they're benevolent. Yes, but the society won't grow. Why? Because there are no freedoms. They say, but if you give freedom, it's messy. Yes, that's what they said to Paul. They said, if you move, if you move the law, you'll have licentiousness. People will do whatever they want to do. And Paul says, not if they're submitted to Christ. So the, the classic example is the woman caught in adultery brought by the Pharisees to Jesus. Well, even before that, okay, adultery, immoral, illegal, death penalty. Moses. Samuel. King David. Adultery, immoral. Nathan comes and says, David, <laughs> no, I shouldn't have done that. Illegal? No. Why not? They changed the law. Well, who gave him the right to do that? God did. Is God going to bless that adultery? Oh, no, that's what Emmanuel comes to say. You may have gotten away with this, David, in the court of human law, but you do not get away mm -hmm. with this in God's court. We have got to be satisfied to have boundaries on civil law that are godly boundaries, and that civil law will never per perfect society. Okay, now we're down here to Jesus. Who's in government? Rome. Is adultery illegal? No. Where are we? Jerusalem. But the Romans are in political power. The Pharisees come to Jesus and say, Moses told us, this woman's been caught in adultery, number one. I want to know where the man is, but that's another subject. So I, yeah. okay, Moses told us, this is immoral and illegal, and the punishment is stoning her. Stone her, Jesus. <laughs> now, this is a very funny story, if you understand what's really going on, because Israel, as a religious people, have not practiced adultery as being illegal for quite a few hundred years. <laughs> I mean, they didn't stone David either, or Solomon, or any other king that they had. You can go all the way, you know, so this is so ludicrous. It's only Moses who said this. The tradition of Israel has not been that adultery would be illegal. Are you with me? They changed the law. They changed it a long time ago. But now the Pharisees, appearing to be religious, not really, but trying. Come to him, but it's Roman law. Adultery is not illegal under Roman law, but stoning someone is. So what are these guys doing? Well, they're trying to use Moses to get Jesus to break Roman law so he will be accused and guilty of murder and they'll be rid of him. They, they want a standard of obedience to the law of Moses they haven't kept in hundreds and hundreds of years. Now, now Jesus, you know, is writing in the sand, and what's, yeah, I've heard all sorts of messages about what he's writing. It doesn't make any difference what he wrote. He would have told us if that was important. What he's doing is consulting the, the Father. What do I do with this now? Because the values of God go forward, but, but the legal application judicially changes. 
Why? Because the people are empowered to change it. Okay, so Jesus says, you throw the first stone, which gets them on both levels. Morally, they have no right to judge, and legally, they will now be guilty of murder. <laughs> I love God. God is so brilliant. He always goes, and two. <laughs> Perfect. He doesn't debate with them. He just, he just out does them. And they know exactly what he's doing. And then he turns to the woman because, because he still cares and says, go sin no more. <coughs> This is destroying you. Please choose to stop. Wow. What a revelational understanding of the difference between civil law and moral law. Civil law in a just political system you get to vote on. Moral law is set by God. We don't vote on it. Don't worry. Moral law is never in danger. It never has been. It never will be. Why? Because it's reinforced by God. Amen. Civil law goes up and down. We get better laws. We get worse laws. We get better laws. We get worse laws. Well, what are we supposed to do? Get the best laws you can. And how do we do that? Persuade the people, the community that is in their best interest. Demonstrate the truth of living that way. How can you live breaking God's moral and civil laws and try to get a better community out of your life? <laughs> you can't. So if you're not even persuaded as a believer that we should obey God and live according to at least something of his law, then how are you going to get a higher level of civil justice in your community? You can try. Oh, I made a woman so angry in Singapore when I said this. She had to be the leader of the group I was meeting with. She stood up and said, we don't have to achieve perfection before we try to influence our society. I said, well, you know, you changed my point and you are now accurate. <laughs> But you at least have to agree with God it's wrong and have some owning of personal responsibility for those choices if you are going to hold the community at large legally responsible for those same choices. Well, this is just, this was too foreign. Why? Because we no longer distinguish between moral law and civil law. We can't think like that. But our forefathers could. And Jesus could. And Moses could. <laughs> okay? So every legal issue that's on the playing field in our communities, everything we're called upon to have an opinion that revolves around civil law has a biblical value set that has to be kept, which includes the right to not obey God Sometimes. And you know this when it comes to evangelism because you know we cannot make a law, you will be a Christian. Okay, so God is the governor of moral law. We will all stand trial for everything we have done. Yes. But praise God, in Christ we will not all get the consequences. But we cannot legislate all moral law. You would have to make all lying illegal. Every society has to decide how big does the lie have to be. <laughs> because you can't judicate, meaning you can't administrate running every liar through court and finding a consequence. You, you, you would simply clog the courts and people would get away with huge injustices while we're spending time on, well, I lied to my mother about getting a tattoo. 
Is it a sin? Yes. Is it destructive? Yes. Not because of the size of the lie, because of the deception you're sowing within your own personality and your willingness to take the cheap answer. Should we make it illegal? We can't. Why? So we have to decide how big does a lie have to be before it's illegal? How much do I have to steal before <laughs> you take me to court? They, I, was, I was robbed in South Africa, which I say makes me a true South African. And uh, I usually get a laugh from South Africans at that point. And, uh, and you know, the insurance company was great, and, and they investigated it was great, but they didn't follow through because they have so much theft, and it really wasn't that big. <laughs> I understand completely. Now, Americans pretend it doesn't matter how big it is. We should be after them and going and taking them to do. <laughs> what do you mean? You mean, you know, in Detroit, you, you, you steal five bucks, we're going to take you to prison? I don't think so. You can't even take somebody to prison in Detroit when they burn a house down. Well, because, why? Because they're burning everything down. You see, civil law has limits, and they have to be administrated. And you say, but we, but we shouldn't change it. We shouldn't change the limits, but should is a moral question. But we must. Why? Because to have any level of justice, we must have a definition of the boundaries of justice, and it will never be perfect. How much do I have to abuse the child before the courts take the child away? What is child abuse? If your standard is too high, you have to take all children away. If your standard's too low, children will die in masses. So you have to find what? An acceptable standard that doesn't destroy parental authority and doesn't allow massive abuse of parental authority. And Christians go, I don't like that because it's gray. Exactly, because it's human. Should parents beat their children? No. How much can they beat their children? <laughs> what is beating? These are technical legal questions. And what is God's strategy? To keep permanent harm, and I'm even going to go so far as to say physically, from that child being done. You see, because if I don't make permanent harm physical, all parents are abusing their children. And when they become Christians and come to our discipleship schools, one of the things we have to work through is the imperfection of the parenting and then the imperfection of the child. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, I, I gotta give you one more example because this is so pertinent. I, I, uh, God takes one case in, in the Old Testament and he, and he says this, this is an example of justice. Justice is defined in scripture by the appropriate rights given to the appropriate people to make the appropriate decisions at the appropriate time. In Hebrew, it is proper order, not perfection, proper order. Okay, does the government make that decision? Does the individual make that decision? Did the doctors make that decision? Do the pastors make that decision? Who makes that decision? That is a question of authority, power, and justice. Okay, so God, out of all of Jewish history, takes one case, Jewish history meaning before Jesus, takes one case and says, this is an example. And it's where Solomon uh, dreams, he prays, which I think is kind of an interesting thing. He doesn't pray it, he dreams he prays, meaning it was on the heart of God, and the only way he could get through to Solomon was to have him dream it. <laughs> it's not Solomon's virtue, it's God's virtue in trying to get Solomon to understand the best justice. 
Okay, he prays, God, I don't know how to come in and out. I don't have the wisdom to know how to lead these people, how to govern these people. And you remember God said, because you didn't ask for riches or fame, I will give you wisdom in governing. He didn't have a lot of wisdom in anything else. Continue to read. <laughs> Little off on family, only by about 999. <laughs> really loses the plot when he's writing Proverbs. <laughs> But in governing, categorically, he had wisdom. I wouldn't vote for him if he ran for president. <laughs> okay, and God takes one example of his wisdom. <laughs> You're going to so hate this. I did this up in, in uh, Manchester a couple years ago, and I had a guy that was in, in theology. He was a theologian with the Anglican Church and quite involved in training and, you know, quite, quite a mover and a shaker. And as soon as I told him the story I was going to use, he said, oh, God, don't go there. Because <laughs> he already knew. The example is Solomon hears a case of two women who claim a child belongs to them. It's a child custody case. Okay, now we're comfortable with that, but we, we consistently forget that both of these women are prostitutes. <laughs> okay, so you know the story. Solomon does investigation. He cannot find any reason in his investigation to deny either woman a right to have her child. <laughs> he, does not, <laughs> he does not inquire whether, uh, what her sexual preferences are and how much she makes when she's a prostitute and whether she does business at home. Are you with me? None of that's even part of the case. He, he tries to determine one fact and one fact alone. Who would give up their rights for this child to live? That's it. Okay, and, and so, so he can't discover that by evidence and investigation because there are no witnesses. <laughs> And so he devises a scheme to reveal motive. Motive of whether they're mother or not? No. Motive of whether they have the child's best interest in mind. And he says, okay, I'll split the child. You both take them. And he gives it to the one who says, no, I give up my right for the child to live. He says, the child is yours. Does he know that, it's, that she's the mother? No. We know that because God tells us. Does the mother have the right even if she says cut the child in half? No, that's an abuse of parental authority. <laughs> Does the mother lose her rights because she has a sexual uh, vocation? She's a sex worker in our modern language. No. Should she you lose? Should she be a sexual worker? No. <laughs> Do you see how complex it is? Scripture simply doesn't agree with our modern evangelical view of where to draw the lines. I ask a group of students in a classroom to put the criterion on the board with me. Just name the criterion. I said it can be cultural. It can be, it can be your, your view as a Christian. It can just be your personal view. What criterion by which should we decide custody of a child? And we filled the board. And I just had him sit there for a while. Now remember, I live in South Africa. I had him sit there for a while. And I said, now here's, here's what I want you to realize. You have given me legal rights to take every child in the townships of South Africa away from their parents. Now what are we going to do? And who's going to raise them? And they were floored. I said, your standard's not God. You who are here 
to pursue justice for children, justice for women, do not have a biblical definition of what justice is. So sobering, isn't it? Okay, now I want to finish with this story because it bridges us to the next section. <laughs> this is a true story. There is a, um, there was a court case in the United States and uh, a woman and, and her boyfriend had been found guilty of grievous uh, premeditated murder. They had been found with the blood and brain matter all over their clothes and the instrument they used to bludgeon to death. Uh, this other person is in the trunk of the car and they are under the influence of drugs and just, yeah, we did it. And the story, the story is that uh, this was the girl's former boyfriend. And she convinces her new boyfriend to murder. I think they might have murdered a couple, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So in the American system, if you say, well, I did it, I did it, but they initiated it. So I'll give evidence. I'm guilty, but I'll give evidence against this other person. Then you probably don't get the death penalty if you're in a state. You probably get life imprisonment or something lesser. Okay, but the other person is out of luck because the deal's been done. So they get, well, he immediately said, it was her idea, it's her boyfriend, she talked me into it. So he turns what we call state's evidence, and he gets life in prison, imprisonment. Now, this is in the state of Florida, so it's the death penalty state. And you say, but America shouldn't have the death penalty. But, you know, the Americans have voted on this at least 15 times. <laughs> and so it isn't a should question. It's a who has the right to decide what penalties are we going to give? The people or your country? <laughs> you say, but they're making bad choices. I know. It's just awful, isn't it? <laughs> the human condition, and God acknowledges that. Okay, so, so um, she's convicted. She gets the death penalty. Now, it takes at least 12 years to go through appeals on a death penalty in the United States. Don't believe television. They do not always tell you the facts. Um, now, whether that's unusual punishment because it takes so long, you have to go through the process of appeals to make sure the courts didn't make a mistake. And that both costs millions and millions of dollars, and it takes 10 to 12 years. Okay, she's gone through all the appeals, and she's lost because she's guilty. But in that process, she's gotten saved. And she's transformed. She is now the girl you would want your daughter to live with when they go to college. She leads Bible studies. She is, she is so transformed. The staff in the prison give her liberties to go around because she does services for the inmates. And so she has more mobility. I mean, she, she, she says, I am guilty. I want to live. <laughs> the law says I should die. I will be fine in Christ whether I live or die. Wow. Okay, so the last appeal in American states on, on many crimes, but especially crimes with the death penalty, is the governor of the state. Okay, so, so now it's the governor who shall remain nameless, and uh, he's got to make a decision. He actually is a born-again Christian, and he thinks this gal is a terrific gal now, but she has committed murder, and the law in the state is premeditated so, so the American public, of course, began to get involved in this, especially the Christians. Carla is a Christian now! See, and one TV evangelist, who shall remain nameless, <laughs> said, God forgave her, I forgive her, the governor should forgive her. Well, what an interesting system of justice. Now, let's suppose we applied that. <laughs> we said, yeah, this is, if you come to Christ, 
your sentence should be reduced. <laughs> Can you imagine tomorrow in the prison? Hallelujah, Jesus! I love Jesus. I study scripture. I'm going to go and lead Bible studies. Yes, I am. Now, the state is going to have to determine whether you're really a Christian. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Even pastors can't figure out if that's true. <laughs> you see, because, because, because they have nothing to do with each other. Political justice is under the law. Moral justice is I'll forgive you for anything. But you still suffer these consequences. Your, your, your redemption is eternity. Now, here's what no Christian asks in, in the public forum. I don't know, maybe somebody did behind the scenes. Almost always there's somebody. Nobody asked, are there other Christians on death row in this state? And there were. I think it was six. But they were men. And they were black. This had nothing to do with morality or justice. This was about gender. Well, to make a long story short, the governor did the right thing in God. Not what he wanted to do, but what he had to do because of the law of the land. And Carla Faye Tucker's fine. I have that on supreme authority. <laughs> the authority of the church as an institution is different than the authority of the state. The authority of the church under God is different than the authority of the state under God and if we are going to disciple our nations we must be able to discern the difference and that's what we're going to talk about next <laughs>